Hello there, I'm Alyssa Olenek, scientist, exercise enthusiast, weightlifter, outdoors lover, and entrepreneur. I believe that the extremes in the fitness and wellness industries are leaving way too many of us out of the conversation, not telling us the knowledge that we actually need to succeed in our health, our wellness, our nutrition, and quite frankly, our lives. They end up giving us black and white polarizing messages that leave us more confused than giving us the answers that we need. Through my 10 years of studying exercise science, metabolism, and female physiology, as well as exploring the outdoors and being a fitness athlete myself, I'm here to bring to you the conversations that need to be had in an industry that often is too far focused on extremes. So if you join me on this podcast, I truly believe that life is best lived in the messy middle. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Messy Middle podcast. We already had Dr. Karin. Did I say that correct this time? Okay. Yeah, Karin, you did. Okay. I always worry that I say it wrong. On earlier in this uh, previous season, and everyone loved her episodes so much. It's probably one of our top episodes that we have out there, especially one of our most listened guests. Um, that I decided that we had to have her back on here to chat again about New Year's goals and setting New Year's goals and what that looks like in long-term goals, because there's a lot of slack and hate on the New Year resolution thing, but also a lot of good and positive that comes out of it, but not even necessarily the New Year itself, but starting over on on a Monday, a birthday, a start of a new month, a start of a new year, a start of a new decade, whatever that looks like it means to you. Um, A lot of people hate on that stuff, but there's some validity and worth in doing that, but Also, no matter who you are or when you're starting a goal, whether it's a Wednesday in the middle of October or the 1st of January, whatever that looks like for you, we're going to talk about some actionable things that you can do that can help you improve your goal setting um, and make them realistic, what that looks like. And if those of you who have not listened to the previous episode, Karin has her PhD in psychology and mindset and all of these behavior change stuff. So she is truly an expert on these things. So well, I'll chime in my own personal opinion on many things, I'm sure, in the episode because... I like to think I have someone who has a little bit semblance of idea how to set goals and achieve them. Um, Her stuff is going to be way more rooted than evidence where mine will just be like my personal opinion, which it turns out most of what she says fits my bias. And so that's why I just personally have her on my podcast anyway. So welcome back to the messy middle. I know that everyone is so stoked that you are back here. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. And I will say, you know, yes, I mean, you and I obviously talk all the time or I'll like like reply to your stories on Instagram and be like, actually, you're correct. And and this is why. So you have hypotheses about how change works and your hypotheses just so happen to usually be supported by research. Um, The one thing I'll say before we start is, you know, I think you you kicked us off by really talking about um, people's hate on New Year's and the season itself. And I am personally a New Year's super fan. Like it's like my Super Bowl. It's like my favorite day all year. Um, And I've seen all this stuff recently that's like, there's nothing special about January 1st. And that's actually not true um, because our brain uses New Year's, new months, Mondays, things like that, they're called temporal landmarks. And it's like a way our brain marks time. And so there is some research that shows that significant changes are easier to make on the beginning of the semester, on a Monday, on New Year's. Um, And so I think we can recognize that we don't necessarily have to wait for that to make a change, but we can also embrace that there is something special about moments like this. Yeah. I mean, I even think I've always not loved that narrative either because I've always, I love fresh starts. I love new years. I love birthdays and I'm someone who really does set goals and falls through, falls through on them. It's not like I'm someone who just can't start something in a random week or day and make that happen. But there is something so special about that, like the almost like the possibility of that or the freshness or the cleanness of it. And like, I don't know, I love New Year's Day. I love New Year's. I love sitting down in a coffee shop. Um, I call the week before New Year's fuck up free week. That's my, what I like to call it. Um, because you can start setting your intentions for what you want to do better the next year or you want to do, but you can kind of start practicing implementing them, but like you can fuck it up as much as you want. I like to call it, that's like something I've been doing since I was in like probably college where I like take a moment and get a good cup of coffee, set my intentions for the year and like what I want to do. And then I'm like, okay, well, like what can I start working towards now to implement that? But like, if I fuck it up, then it doesn't matter because it's not January 1st, which is so silly. But like, that's something I've done for years. Um, because it's like, it feels good to have a fresh start of the new year and like what that year can be and like segmenting your year is almost like chapters of your story and your brain and your memory. Like that's how I think of it. And so I want to just say for my audience that I am not team hate on New Year's because I think there's so much beauty in 
saying I'm going to go become this thing or do that I want to do and just declaring it on, on the start of something new. Like it just feels a little bit magical and like fresh. And I just love that feeling. So, yeah. And so one thing I really encourage people to do, particularly if you're a perfectionist and you struggle with all or nothing mentality is, um, take, you know, your ideals of like a fuck up week and apply that to actually the month of January. Right. So what I encourage people to do is view January as a, a prototyping month where you set your intentions or your goals for the year, you think about the behaviors you want to be doing. And your goal in January is to learn as much as possible about what makes those happen rather than to achieve perfect like 31 out of 31 days adherence on your new habit. If you reframe it like that, it's going to be easier for your perfectionistic brain to deal with that failure. And you're probably going to be able to hold on. So, you know, you're, you're saying I'm going to fuck up the week before new year's. I encourage everybody to intentionally, you know, fuck up the first week, mess up that first week of January and then learn from it because that kind of like practicing failure and getting better at failure is going to be one of the things that's going to set you up for success later on too. I love that because I think that's how, I mean, God, just being okay with failing the entire year, I feel like is how you get to any goal worth doing. Like, I think people severely underestimate how much people who are successful and achieve goals or do big things or do great things or even do small things that are hard for us to do. I know you and me have very similar backgrounds and kind of hating the way that we are wired and hating our brains and being obsessed with behavior change really early on in our 20s before we learn to like give grace and work with ourselves. And one of those things is like, I know for me and probably very much so for you is just being okay with like, you're going to freaking fail all of the time, but like using that rather than as a hard break, but like a reassessment or a time to audit or a like, Oh, this is just, okay. I tried really hard. And sometimes you just fail because you tried the hardest you could and you found the limit like that doesn't make you bad because so many people just don't even try to get to that point anyway. So I love that. I love that. Let's just have a, let's call 2020 the like, like, I don't know. I don't want to say fuck up for a year because that's not true. But like, how do we lean into that? How, what, I don't know what the cool phrase for that is to lean into 2020. Um, but I like that. I like that approach not so 2022? much. I think, oh my God, 2022. God, I don't, I don't even know. I don't know what month it is. I don't know what year it is. I don't know what decade it is. <sighs> uh, well, Technically, if you ask me, it is still 20. It's still 2020. It's just like yeah. You were just talking for the last like three minutes, like it was 2019 still, and we were entering 2020, which I think is how a lot of people. I'm going to give a lot of people like flashback trauma. They're going to think they're going to have to go relive 2020 all over again. Please don't. I feel like I'm just emotionally recovering now already from everything. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think you make a good point in that your question really is like, how can you embrace failure more Mm -hmm. in 2022. And one thing that people, a lot of people don't do is they don't look back on the previous year and analyze their failures very neutrally and in a, in a helpful way. And so I think one of the ways we can get more excited about failure is to actually look at all the things that went ro- wrong, quote unquote, wrong in 2022 and ask yourself, like, what skills did I grow by failing here? And what skills do I maybe want to continue working on in 2022? And if you focus it, that's it's called a mastery orientation. Um, and if you're focusing on skill development, then you're a little bit more willing to understand that failure is part of the process. If you were going to learn piano, you would not expect to sit down and play Little, Mary had a little lamb perfectly and then graduate to the next song and play that perfectly and then graduate to the next song, right? But people expect that they can just all of a sudden decide to have, you know, more quote unquote discipline or more quote unquote motivation. And they don't realize that that's not a decision. It's not a quality. It is a skill that you can grow. I want to, I want to, I want to chat, I want to chat and dig a little deeper into that comparison though, because I feel like there's a difference in the types of activities that we're willing to give ourselves grace on, right? Like, I feel like for most of us, if we were to start trying to play the piano, especially in our 20s, 30s, whatever, as grown adults, we probably wouldn't like beat ourselves up that much about that. Like, we'd be like, oh, okay, like, obviously, like, 
I suck at this. If they, unless you had some comparison of you being a child prodigy and then taking a decade off or something like that. But like, if we were to pick up something stupid like that, we would probably like not have this deep shame tied to not being excellent at the piano right away. Right. But we have very specific goals that are so pushed to us around new year's, right. Usually around bodies, fitness, finance, at like at all these different types of things um, that we tie so much pressure and shame and like no room for failure in them whatsoever. And is there anything that you can speak of, of like why that is, or is that just because of like the social narrative around these types of things or people believe they have to have certain types of goals or there's less pressure because people aren't like people don't really have harsh opinions about people's piano skills because we don't pay piano but like a lot of people have opinions about food and fitness because we're because if you eat food and you move your body you're an expert in everything right so is that like where does that come from and how do we disassociate with like maybe the societal pressure of certain goals so we can focus on just ourselves in those outcomes rather than like what they should be, what they need to look like, how they should feel, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I think what you're really talking about is a people have a fixed mindset about um, their ability to navigate their own lives. And that is because if you look at the way we talk about behavior change, we talk about it as if it's a result of a series of qualities. So it's like if you have self-control, you can change your behavior. If you have discipline, you can change your behavior, right? And the problem with, you know, discipline is the one I hate on the most because what even is discipline, right? Discipline is, okay, people define it as like your ability to dictate what you do on a regular basis or your ability to control yourself, right? But what people don't realize is that's not some, you know, inherent ability that you either have or you don't have. Like people will say to me, oh, I just, I, I don't have self-control. Like I don't really have much discipline as a person or I need, I need more discipline. Mm -hmm. And what they don't realize is that discipline is the name we have given to what it looks like when you increase a very specific series of mental skills, right? So someone who's like, I have discipline when I go to, when I don't feel like going to the gym, I just go. Okay, let's look at that for a minute. Yeah. First of all, the person, that person has a heightened amount of awareness probably about what's going on in their brain when those thoughts start to occur. So when the resistance to the gym starts to pop up, that person has a high amount of awareness as to what those thoughts exactly are. Two, that person probably has um, heightened skills in things like emotional regulation Um, or like mind management, I call it. So that person is able to recognize the unhelpful thoughts that are like, we can't go to the gym today and redirect their brain towards like, hey, we're going to go to the gym today. You know, this is really important to us. Use that outcome-based thinking, et cetera, right? Three, that person probably has systems and routines set up to make that gym process as easy as possible. And four, that person also has years of practice of using those mental skills over and over and over and over again. So for the person who, quote, has discipline, it feels really natural. But for the person who doesn't have those mental skills, they're never told how to actually develop discipline or that it's a skill in in the first place. So if I can, like, give people one reframe to put in your head for 2022, it would be to focus more on what mental skills you need. And those are usually things like flexibility, self-compassion, awareness, mindfulness, like all of these skills that people kind of shrug off. Those are actually the things you need to focus on in order to change your behavior. And I think it's so funny too, especially when we get into the narrative. And I would assume that people think that I fall into this camp of being a little bit more hard ass and gritty in the way you approach things because of just the nature of how I am and the things that I do. But Really, like, people think that you have to be this, like, big, tough, macho, awesome, badass person to be like, I go to the gym, I eat chicken, I eat my protein, I'm disciplined, I wake up early. And I think it's so funny because, like, again, you and me have similar backgrounds in how we were growing up. I was a chaotic mess going into my 20s, and I knew the kind of person that I wanted to be. And I did not know how to get there. I didn't. I was obsessed with it, and I didn't know how to get there. But I had to give myself a lot of grace and a lot of compassion and a lot of things that I like to really, I just feel so woo-woo to me because I'm like, I'm not like, Liz, you are just a beautiful butterfly and you deserve the grace to go to the gym today because you love it. I'm like, no, but like I use the time to cultivate skills 
decrease resistance, decrease decision fatigue, decrease anything that got in my way of going there. So it's not a heroic effort for me to go to the gym when I go because it's built into my schedule. And I think a lot of people forget that in order to become what you think is like the ultimate tough guy or badass or disciplined person, like, oh, is actually a lot of like doing less, being indirectly lazy, being like specifically lazy, which gets frowned upon and hated on. And two, it involves like really heightened self-awareness, which I think sometimes people just don't have. And three, being nice to yourself. Being mean to myself literally got me nowhere. I like had to stop being mean to myself because that like an internal narrative isn't what you're going to get. And so to pivot that though, for people who maybe they resonate with the word discipline more, I guess, like if someone came to me and said, I want to get toned, like I could scream at them all day and say toned isn't a thing. Or I can be like, okay, well, like this is how you get to this goal. So for those that are still convinced that they need to be disciplined or want to be disciplined, or they want to be a disciplined person type thing, what steps do they actually need to be taking or maybe implementing into their January and their, and their fuck up month of the year in order to actually get on the track of becoming a person who looks disciplined, quote unquote, to the outside eye, even if it doesn't actually involve the traits that we think are normally associated with that? Yeah. So there's three things that come to mind. And I know you're going you're gonna to love these because I know you're a bigger proponent of these. So the number one thing is essentialism or prioritizing. Okay. If you want to be really good at something, if you want to be disciplined in a certain area, you're going to have to let go of things. You're going to have to give up on things, right? That's just the way life works. I always tell people that, you know, a lot of people go into the new years and they set 26 different goals or like, seven different goals. And what you're doing is you're running one mile of 26 different marathons. And then you're mad that you don't get a medal. You're like, I'm not getting anywhere. I feel like I've run a marathon and I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah, you did run a freaking marathon, but you ran one mile of every single race. And so guess what? You got nothing. There was no reward. There was no F like no finish line for you because you spread your energy across too many different places. And so the number one thing is like, knowing what is important to you and why it's important to you. Um, so I don't know if you, to, if you want to jump in on that before I go to the next one. No, I think that's so true. And I think people also, my my opinion would be with that is that if you have to give up things you're already doing in order to focus on those two things you want to achieve, that doesn't mean that you are necessarily failing those things. So I'll use myself as an example since this is my platform and people follow me is I'm not training for ultra marathons right now. You could technically say you're a failure, you're a fraud, you put on this big hype that you're an ultra runner and you're not even doing it, but that is not something that can be a priority in the season for me to achieve the other things that I want to do. Something had to scale back so my other things could scale up, right? Where balance isn't a thing, it's a harmony of priorities. That doesn't mean I fail, that doesn't mean I'm not an ultra runner, that doesn't mean that I am a fraud, it just means that right now I am not prioritizing that thing in my life because it is not important and it distracts from the things that I'm trying to to do. And I think people tend to think, well, if I'm backing off on this, well, then I suck and I'm awful. So they feel like, especially with that concept of balance that people are obsessed with, that you have to be doing everything well all the time. And I guess this could go into a rant of people say, how do you do it all? And you do, I do a lot of other things really poorly, but they're just not important to me. And I do not care. I don't care that my laundry basket is exploded in my closet right now because I did a photo and video shoot yesterday because in order for me to get those photos and videos done, make this podcast and get on my flight home tomorrow while also doing the work that I need to do today, that doesn't need to get done. That's not important. But if I woke up this morning with a mint shame that I wasn't going to do that on top of my workout, on top of everything else, then I'd be a failure for today. And I think people forget to reframe into like, why like being okay with other things not being a priority but your like your value your worth or your success or whatever you're doing is not tied to doing everything all at once perfectly like you're gonna have to maybe let something go if you're gonna put more of your energy into one thing to to develop that skill or whatever that is right and you know one big myth I see especially in like new year's journals and planners and trainings is like set one goal for each area of your life your life doesn't have areas it doesn't even even like business versus personal, like if you're training for an ultra marathon and trying to, you know, hit an enormous income goal in your business, those are both depleting the same resources, which are your energy, your time and your self-regulation. 
So you mm-hmm. can't separate those things, right? And so that's one mistake I see people do is they like they pick a goal for eat. They like divide their life into their arbitrary areas. They're like, this is my financial goal and this is my fitness goal. Guess what? Unfortunately, it costs a lot of money to do various fitness. And so you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to save all the money, but also I'm going to do everything possible to get really jacked because at the end of the day, when you need to buy that $45 supplement, like what are you going to choose? You have to have those priorities, right? Um, Which brings me to thing number two is that people don't strategically break the year into chunks or like seasons, right? So I personally really recommend that you break the year down into quarters. One of the reasons that people are hesitant to set a full goal for the whole year is they're like, I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, cool. Set a big purpose, right? What's your big purpose for the year? And then make that into something that's a little bit more concrete on a quarterly basis, right? So I have a like pretty massive revenue goal for my business set for next year. Mm-hmm. But on a quarterly basis, I'm going to make sure I look like look at what actual behaviors I need to be doing and what actual skills I need to develop in order to make progress and hit my like benchmark of that bigger goal. So that's another thing too. No, I fully agree. And I think that we you know we're in a fitness related niche, so I can say this. And I like looking at life like fitness. I periodize my life according. We don't max out or do high volume blocks every single block of training in the year. We don't. We have times where we do lower volume, lower intensity. We have deload weeks. We have one training session on a Monday that's really intense and then two easier ones the rest of the week. Like I periodize my weeks and my work and that all across the year because you can't go 100% all of the time. You really can't. I would love to. If I could find a secret hack to go with the intensity of which I wanted to do every single day and not burn out and die and crash and have my brain stop making connections, yeah, I would absolutely do it. I'd pay a bajillion dollars for that secret hack, but it's not possible. I'm human and I have to give myself grace, right? Just like all of you listening to this, like you got to give yourself grace because then you're just going to drive yourself mad because that perfectious idea of hitting every day 100% does not, it doesn't happen. Like I miss my bench sets Every Monday, I missed a set of bench for like a month. And then I haven't hit, hit missed a rep in three weeks, and I'm going to PR in two weeks. But like those misses didn't mean I failed. It just means that like I had to keep revising the plan of how I can improve that moving forward rather than throwing out the whole ship. And so I love thinking of that in periodization and like putting more efforts in one place versus the other, or maybe days of the week. Um, because you can't do everything every day of the week either. That's why people encourage people to meal prep or pre-track food or, you know, I do business on one day and PhD on another day and things like that because it, it, it you only have so much mental energy to put into things. And so it makes more sense to periodize that on quarters or months or weeks. And then asking yourself what, what she said as well, Karen said as well, is like, what are the small actions or skills that you can do to get there, Right. So I wanted to squat 300 pounds again this year. That's a PR that I haven't hit since I was powerlifting five, six years ago. And I told my coach Noah, and I got injured two different times this year. So my goal was supposed to be hit by July, June, July. And now I'm going to hit it in December. I'm not going to fail my goal. It took me six months longer than planned. I'm not going to fail my goal. But when I was injured, I didn't say, well, screw it. I'm going to stop lifting. I modified around that to do the work that I could do to move me forward. And then I'm still going to most likely hit that goal in a few weeks because I was okay with that. Um, And I'm only going really intense in my training right now leading into it, right? And then we'll regroup and do it all over again. But I had to pick what actions I wanted to do every day this year to get to that goal that I'm going to hit the week before the new year. And so part of that was that I needed to squat two, one to two times a week. That was, that's what I needed to do. I needed to frequently do that action. I couldn't say I'm going to squat 300 pounds this year and just not go to the gym, right? Like I had to make those small actions or small votes or small choices every single day that aligned with that thing that I wanted to do. But eventually they became habitual. I don't even think about Tuesdays is squat day. I squat on Tuesdays. I'm Alyssa Lenick and I squat on Tuesdays. And I know that. And I don't always want to do it, but I do it because I know that that's the person that I am and that's what I do to get to my goal. And that's how we get there over time. So I love fitness analogies for everything just because I feel like it makes it like so, because fitness is so rudimentary. It's stress response recovery adapt right and like that's I think people forget to do the same thing with their their brain maybe or their their choices or their behavior yeah no they absolutely do and people have 
So I want to touch on two things you said. One, I want to touch on the fact that people have wildly unrealistic expectations for their own productivity. People Mm -hmm. think that they should be able to sit down, like they should be able to get up in the morning and make 100% of the best decisions all week long. People expect their you know, they think if they're doing the right thing, that their energy is going to be stable, that they're going to feel happy. And they, when people have a week where they have less energy or they're more moody or they're feeling tired, they make that into this big problem. And they make that into this story about how they don't have, they're not a good person or they don't have enough discipline or they don't have enough willpower, right? In reality, it is just like strength in that like, you're not going to have your best workout every day that you go to the gym and you cannot go to the gym every single day and max out, right? But people expect to show up every single day at work and max out their brain. People expect to be able to have hours of totally uninterrupted focus without being distracted, right? Without, you know, having resistance towards tasks. And I think that's completely bullshit. We've somehow created this like wildly unrealistic idea of what it is like to be a human being. But your brain is a part of your body. So just like your body has natural fluctuations, your brain has natural fluctuations. And that's not something that you need to fix. And it's not something that you need to have a crisis about every time you're having a week where you're like having trouble getting your shit together. Sometimes you're not going to have your shit together. And if you release the expectation that you're going to be 100% on point all time, to- all the time, you're going to be a lot happier in your life, right? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I'm a mess of a human. I feel like people don't think that about people that are successful, but I know you're the same way as me. We're highly educated and we have great businesses and we're smart and we're good at what we do. And you know what? Being hard behind the scenes are tornadoes, probably. We're two tiny twisters existing in our mm-hmm. lives, but- a long time ago, and I know you talked about this, I just forgave myself for being that way because my natural default setting is chaos. I do a lot of controlling my life to control my own chaos. And I do a lot to reduce the chances of tempting that within myself because I know that's my default setting. I know my default setting is to be literally a mess, just absolute chaos. And so I have worked with behavior choices and skills with myself over years and years and years to reduce that so my default is less f- drastic in my chaoticness, but I have weeks all the time where like, I even said to my coach today, I was like, I'm not getting enough work on my PhD done this week, but like my brain's just not there. I'm tired for some extra reason. I don't have enough times of strict focus. So I said, I think I'm just going to give myself grace and do all the other little things that don't require a lot of attention and get those done because that's still buying future me time. And I know I can trust myself to get those things done when I just have a day where I can just put it all into that one thing instead of having my energy everywhere. And he, cause I, he said to me and like, I wasn't even mad at myself. I was just telling him about my life. And he said a great statement today, shout out to Noah. Um, and he said, why is that a bad thing? When I said I wasn't getting a lot of work done on my PhD this week, he's like, why is that a problem? He's why is that a problem? And I was like, it's really not a problem. I have plenty of other things I can do. And I, I, I know that I'll get it done. And I know the environment I need in the focus and the amount of time I need. And that's just not optimal for me right now. And if it wasn't a time crunch, I'd have to make it work or figure it out. And that's a time of going all in. But I thought that statement was fantastic. He's like, why is it a problem? And I was like, it's really, it's not a problem, right? Like, as long as I know I can trust myself to do the thing that I need to do in order to move myself forward, eventually at some point, then it's okay that today sucks. And that I suck at today. Like that, that, that's okay. Well, and I want to point out that even that is like a judgment of yourself, right? Like I work with so many clients who beat themselves up at the end of every day because they, and they come to me because they're like, I'd never get enough done. And the very first thing we do is like, A, we clarify what they think enough supposedly is, right? Mm -hmm. So we write our little to-do list in the morning and we decide arbitrarily that like these five things are what we need to get done today and that that's enough. Right. And then if we only do four out of five, five things, then we decide that that's not enough and that we weren't productive enough. And then that causes these feelings of guilt and shame. Right. But the truth is that's, that's not admissible in court, right? Like we have no actual data about what it was that you did today that could have been enough or not enough. We have literally no idea. And perhaps what you 
you know, the brain power you conserve today is what allows you to power through things tomorrow, right? And yeah. so what I encourage people to really do is like practice noticing the judgment of your own productivity, of your own like accomplishments, and then practice releasing that and reminding yourself that you have no idea if what you did today was enough or not. And you won't know. You won't ever know. Um, but I think you also said something there, which is like, you know that at the end of the day, you're still moving towards like where you want to go. And so a lot of people ask me, um, and I know one of your Q&A questions was like, should I set intentions or should I set like smart goals? Yeah. And my answer to that is that you need both. You need to be looking at what your daily life look, looks like and the tiny behaviors and choices that are going to make things easier for you. But you also need a sense of big purpose, right? You also need that larger idea because, you know, let's say that my goal at the end of this quarter is to, um, I don't know. Let's let's say it's to like launch something in my business and have 50 people enrolled in it, right? And then I distill that down to behaviors and I'm like, okay, I need to work on this thing for 30 minutes every single day in order to have – let's pretend it's a dissertation. Let's pretend my dissertation needs to be done. It's already done. But let's pretend it needs let's to be done by the end of the quarter. you're not me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'm going to work on it 30 minutes per day. If I go a week without working on it, if I only have that 30 per minute, minutes per day goal, then it's like I have a crisis about that because I like I'm like I didn't hit my goal, blah blah blah. But guess what? There are a million ways to hit your big purpose, and if you stay centered on that, like it's like a north star I think of, and you can always, no matter what happens, you can always just pivot in the direction of that big purpose. So if you get to March and your goal. You know, you haven't taken your dog for a walk a single day and your goal was to do it every day all year, but you know that your big purpose was to move more so that you feel healthier and can be more active with your kids. Great. Then you can still go outside and take a walk that day and you can still take a step towards that big purpose. So it's about balancing what you actually want in life and why you want it, why it's important to you, not just because it's something you think you should do. Yeah. and what that actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. No, something my advisor did really early on in our PhD, pre-Panini, um, <laughs> when we'd meet a lot more frequently in person, is in the very beginning, he would ask us every week in this Friday lab meeting is, what did you do to move yourself closer to graduation today? Because in the beginning of your PhD, it's like graduation doesn't exist. It is infinity years away. You can't even conceptualize it. And it's kind of okay that you can't conceptualize it because if you think about how much work you have to do from point A to point B in that, it it will crush you. You just can't even think about it, right? But that was a really great way to reframe it because it's just, what did I do this week that moved me forward? Because even if you don't hit all of your goals and all of your to-do list tasks, which I can say I don't think ever in my entire life Maybe 5% of the time I hit every one of my to-do list tasks on the day. I have the queen of re I just do ongoing to-do lists because there's no daily tasks. There's, these are the things that need done and I'm going to cross them off as I do them because that's just unrealistic. Monday's tasks become Wednesdays and that's always how it's going to be. Like we're human. But that was a great way to like then pause and look back at the week and be like, oh, I didn't really fuck up. I still moved forward. I still took actions and choices to move forward rather than looking at, well, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. I needed to be doing this. Well, what did you do that moved you forward? What did you move that got you closer? And all those little baby action steps that I took four years ago, well, they got me to where I am now. Looking back at everything I've done between that point and now, I, I don't even I can't even conceptualize that I did it, right? But I did it in tiny little steps that just moved me forward day at a time. And the broader picture was that I wanted my PhD, not because no one wanted it. No, everyone thinks that me getting a PhD is a terrible idea. No one thinks that this is a good idea except for me, right? Like most people think that like that, that's stupid, but it meant something to me. And it was something that I valued and I wanted. And that's all that I only had to do is have that buy-in. And I think maybe people should do that more often is ask themselves, like, what did I do this week to move myself closer to that goal? Especially when they're really big long-term goals that aren't only a January of each year goal. Because your goals should be long-term, right? Like, they shouldn't just be, like, 
I mean, maybe they can be short term, but ideally, if you're looking for behavior change, I'm assuming people want these things to last longer than just one month or three months of the beginning of every year. They're looking for something bigger. And I think maybe we can pivot into this is like setting goals that are long term, that are bigger, that are multi year, maybe, because I think people think of New Year's goals as just being one year, but you've started a business, you've got graduate degrees you like all, even like my athletic things that I do in my time, none of these are single month, single quarter or single year goals. These are goals, like pretty, I want to call them medium sized goals as part of these massive, big long-term goals. And I think a lot of people either have never been in the experience of having a multi-year or long, big, a really big goal. And that's really scary. And they, and I think because they don't, they haven't done it, they don't know what it looks like where people like us will be like, well, okay, that makes sense. Like I could probably take on another multi-year goal and be okay with it. Cause I know, yeah, I'm going to fail. Yeah. I'm going to suck. Yeah. I'm going to get mad at myself. It's going to need grace. This is how I move forward. So what's your advice to people who they do have goals that are bigger and they want to maybe make goals that like a 2022 goal that is part of a bigger goal or a multi-goal or setting those quarters, like how to break apart these massive things into realistic chunks and maybe make progress within their behavior improvement within it across time. Like what that realistically looks like. Cause again, we're going to, you just get better as you keep going. I would assume the same works with goal setting, behavior change, implementing your goals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think you're getting at something really important, which is that we always have the ability to zoom in and zoom out right? And that's a really powerful idea. So when today, you know, you don't clean your kitchen before you go to bed and you quote unquote fail at your goal for the day, you can zoom out and ask yourself like, why do I want this in the span of 10 years from now? Like 10 years from now, I don't give a single fuck that on, you know, what day is it today? December 16th, I didn't clean my kitchen. I do care 10 years from now that I, you know, established a regular cadence of cleaning my house, right? So one thing that I'm working on is like being a tidier person, you okay? I Guess what? I've been working on that since I exited the womb, You okay? and both, sister. <laughs> and that's not something that I can just you know, decide. And it's not something that I can just immediately flip flop my life into a situation where I, you know, put my freaking coffee cup that I was drinking this morning away. Right. However, if you have a goal that is like multi-year, I would, well, I would encourage people to A, to set those goals. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I do with my clients in that we do, I should say, cause I have assistant coaches now, but one of the things that we do in my coaching program is we start off with what we call a future self mapping session. Mm -hmm. So what that really is, is like, it starts with the question, like, who do you want to be in five years? Who do you want to be in 10 years? And it's much more identity focused. And from Mm -hmm. that identity, you can start to get more specific about what that looks like, right? So in 10 years, I want to be the CEO of like a multi six figure, if not million dollar business. Yeah. Right. That is like what I want. I can't set that as the goal for the end of 2022 and like expect that to be uh, uh, something I want. Right. But if I'm like, okay, if that's the goal, A, like, why do I want that? Well, I want that because I value the information. Like, I love what I do. I really value the freedom that comes with entrepreneurship. That, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I have all my reasons. But then I can say, like, okay, what are the benchmarks? Like if that's who I'm going to be in 10 years, then who am I in five years? And then who am I in two years? And then who am I in one year? And then who am I at the end of this quarter? And you can allow space for your own evolution, but also get a sense of like what that progress might look like long-term. Yeah. I love that. And you know that that before me knowing that's a thing, but that's how I've always done things is I've just said, like when people ask me, who do you look up to? Or who do you like, you know, what, who are your heroes? And I'm like, well, my hero is always my younger version of myself because she envisioned the current version of myself. And I am who I am because one time many moons ago, I said, this is the person that I want to be. So the tidy thing is great because that's me too. And I am substantially cleaner, tidier, more organized to the point that someone would actually probably describe me to a stranger as organized, right? Even though 
inherently to my core, I'm not an organized person. But I know that being organized allows me to do better in multiple areas in my life and move forward. And it works for me. And it's maybe a control mechanism for my undiagnosed ADHD. <laughs> but like, that was like, I wanted to be that kind of person. And I, and I just made little choices once I was independent on my own that allowed me to curate for that. And even like, I'm dating the world's most militant, clean person that I've ever met in my entire life. And I'm still getting reprimanded like a dog that peed on the carpet every day for something that I did because my brain doesn't pick up and notice it. Instead of me being like, I'm the worst girlfriend ever. I'm horrible. I'm a piece of crap because there's chia seeds all over the kitchen. I was like, Regis, how did you expect me to know that there was little tiny seeds all over the kitchen? You think that I got on the floor and looked at that? I was like, that's not... I'm like not going to even get mad at myself for that. Like, I'm like, I'm not even going to mad at myself for that. But now next time I know, maybe you should sweep up after you put powdery things on the counter, right? Like now I'm like, oh, okay, well, I can start implementing that control check in my life. But I think that that's such a great aspect for that too. It's just like, I tell people that all the time. Like, I, I didn't know what, what I was going to be when I grew up, quote unquote, right now, look like what it's going to look like. But I remember 15 and being like, I want to be great. I don't know what I want to be great at, but I want to be great. Like I want to be really good at what I do and I want to be really passionate about it. And I want to be great. And I didn't know what it looked like, but I was just like, I'm just going to work. The person that does great things works really hard at everything they do. Right. And the, and they focus on things that are important and they like care about things that are important and they like, whatever they execute on the things that are important to them. And I was 15. Like that was my, I don't know, but that's how I approached life at 15. But like it, it has transfolded into this stuff. So I obviously agree with the expert here, but like I think for those of you who are setting these goals and, you know, are, especially if it comes to fitness, nutrition, behavior, behavior, business, academic, because I know that's a lot of our audience here is like thinking about what the person that you want to become does and what are the actions that that person takes, Right. I think a great one I always say to people is like, don't ask yourself like what a skinny person does or don't ask yourself what like, I don't know, like a strong person does. Like ask yourself like what is someone who value their health does? Like if you remove still that that really un, like that really ambiguous definition, but like someone who values their health is going to make choices that align with valuing their health. They're not going to make choices like that. Oh, well, this will make me skinnier. Like that's not, that's not, that's not going to make you feel good about the choices. But if you value health, you're going to make better choices for what you do. So even though I wanted fries with my dinner last night, I was also wanted a burger, but I got a side salad instead because I knew that I was like, I will feel better if I eat this salad, right? Where sometimes I make the choice to get the fries. So like the person I am values these right now more than this other thing. But I was like, no, I know that the person I am values health and that these things are good for me. And it's not a choice out of scarcity and it's not a choice out of shame or hate. It's a choice for the vote of the person that I hope to be tomorrow kind of thing. So yeah. Well, and I think that's one thing that people miss is they get super focused on like consistency and streaks and they're like, oh, 26 out of 30 days this month I did X and they forget that no matter what you did yesterday and no matter what you do tomorrow, like consistency is actually irrelevant when it comes to your choice in any given moment mm -hmm. because your choice to, you know, go to bed on time on Tuesday, even though you haven't gone to bed on time for the week prior and you won't go to bed on time the next two days, that choice in that individual moment still benefits you yeah. and still can take, get you closer to. So like, I think exactly what you're saying is I call it my future self. Like I literally yeah. refer to her as like Karin 2.0. And no. I will ask myself, yeah. like, what does Karin 2.0 choose in this situation. And one of the visuals I use with clients too is to think about it like you're like literally like knitting a quilt, right? I want you to imagine a quilt where somewhere, you know, on on the spectrum of like left to right, somewhere in the middle, the stitching changed and they started stitching in a different pattern, right? That's what it looks like to change your life. And in that middle part, you might stitch the old stitch for a while and then have one of the new stitches. And then you go back to the old stitch and then you have one of the new stitches. But every single stitch matters and every single stitch gets you closer to that pattern completely changing. And so that is like what it's like to look at your life in terms of taking it one choice at a time and not getting into a spiral about your consistency or what you did yesterday or what you did last week. Like focus on the stitch in front of you and you can either, like you have a choice in front of you 
you have two options. You can either make the choice that keeps you as the person that you currently are. You can reinforce your own behavior and pattern. Or in that moment, you can choose to reinforce a new behavior pattern. Like you are always reinforcing the 1.0 version of yourself or the 2.0 version of yourself. And if you redirect yourself back to that on a daily basis, that's a great way to kind of get out of the clouds and focus on like what's right in front of you. And I think what's great with that too is that you're always making a choice either way. Like you're faced with the choice to do each one, but eventually stitching that new pattern, you won't have to think while doing it. And I think people, for they, they get really bogged down in the mixed pattern phase and not realizing that eventually all those people, again, wrapping to the beginning that have discipline and self-control, all they're doing is they're on autopilot in their pattern knitting or stitching or whatever they're doing. They don't have to mm-hmm. think about doing the things that you are trying to implement. They just, they just, it, the decision was made for them already in their brain before they even had to think about doing it. And I love that too, as well, because I always say, I literally say to myself, I'm like, what, what does my future self need? Like, what do I need to do for my future self? What action do I need to do? And that's not just like the cliche, like stuff that people tie that to. Like, I mean that literally, like, I'm going to organize this file right now, because in the future, I'm going to want to get this and it's going to make my life easier. It's not just like the drinking the water and the eating the vegetables or like, and that's how I actually, I feel like it allows those behaviors that I'm really resistant to. Um, I don't know if this is in our brain, but like, I, I hate folding laundry, right? But if I think about me on Wednesday, I want to fold laundry for her though. But if I think about me on Sunday, I'm like, oh my God, this act is awful, but I can almost motivate myself, quote unquote, to do a behavior that I hate because I know that like I love me and I care about me and I want me to have a better week and I want me to have a better day. And I can make a choice that allows that for myself, like treating myself like, like, like a being that I care about and I take care about. Like if Regis has a really busy week and I know that he doesn't have the ability to clean the kitchen, I'm way more motivated to clean the kitchen because I love Regis and he values a clean kitchen and that reduces his stress. And I don't want him to be more stressed than he is because I know that 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 matters to him. So I'm going to pick up that in my relationship because I love him, right? I can't tell you how often I unload the dishwasher out of love and not because it needs to be unloaded, but I take that same thing and I apply it to myself. Like I love myself. I take care of myself. I want myself to be successful. Like that third person cheesy thing that feels maybe really gross to other people because it's kind of woo woo. And I'm not necessarily a woo woo person. I'm like, you can be like, I love that bitch and I want her to do well. So like, what the hell do I got to do to take care of her? And that's what I, that's like, that's my, I don't do maybe the Karen 2.0, Karen 2.0. I like that. I just say like, what do I need to make my, like, what do I need to do for future me? I think about her all the time. I'm like, homegirl, I got your back. And that's how I feel like I approach 90% of my days. Cause I'm like, I don't want to do this, but I want future me to have a better day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's important too about what you said there is that you're going to, the more you do that, you're going to cultivate that relationship with your future self. And you're going to cultivate a more compassionate relationship with your past self, right? So I can look, you know, on Sunday when my, everything is packed and I'm ready to get in the car, I can look back on my Thursday self who, you know, worked her butt off to get things done and I can be really thankful for her. So if you don't have that, you know, kind, loving, I love myself relationship, it's just like a relationship with anything else where you can 100% work on improving that the same way that you would work on a relationship with, you know, a friend or someone else you care about. Um, And then the other thing too, that I think is really valuable is you mentioned um, that the more you do that, the behaviors are going to become a little bit more automatic, right? And I just want to touch on that because people are Often what I hear is that people get frustrated because their behaviors are not automatic enough, fast enough. So they're like, oh, I've been waking up early for three weeks now and it's still hard. Or like I've been going to the gym for six months now and I'm still feeling resistance. And they like make it a problem that their behavior is not – it doesn't – that their desired behaviors don't feel automatic like – right off the bat, right? The problem there is that, you know, even behaviors where we're like, oh, this is automatic, 
What that really means is that we have less thoughts about it or we have less conscious thoughts about it, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always easier. So my question to people is like, okay, if this never becomes automatic, if it never becomes a habit that you can do without thinking, do you still want to do it? And if the answer is yes, then do it and drop this weird expectation you have about like, when is this going to be easy? Maybe it's never going to be easy. I've been going to the gym for like five years now and it's still not easy and it's still not automatic. There's not going to be a day in my life where I just like naturally pop out of bed and get to the gym on Thursday mornings. Like that's not going to happen. And when I release that as an expectation, then I'm no longer like thinking I did something wrong because I haven't reached that level of like automaticness yet. No, and I completely agree. And I feel like people also do that thing where they observe other people's lives and they have assumed ease looking at what other people are doing. And I know you and me rant about this all the time that ties back in the do it all. How do you balance it all? How do you do this? How do you achieve this narrative where people demean and downplay people's efforts because it looks easy from the outside looking in. And like, that's the point, right? It should look easy from the outside looking in for the people who are doing things well. But that doesn't mean that like that isn't still there. And I think that's like, I always love that you still talk about how you struggle with being adherent and exercise because like it, it is right. Like it's, it's real and it's true. And it doesn't mean that you don't value your health. It doesn't mean that you don't value being strong or you don't value fitness. It's just saying, Hey, this is hard and I don't like it. Right. I'm never going to enjoy cleaning. I'm not never going to enjoy it. I'm never going to enjoy it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then just accept the fact that I hate it. Right. I accept like, and I think that accepting that you hate things that you do kind of, it does, it makes them easier to do. It's like all of a sudden that resistance is there. Right. Like when people, uh, I had my story right earlier this year that we talked about where people were like, how do you wake up early? How do you wake up early? And like when I was waking up early for data collection and testing, I didn't pretend to make myself think that I wanted to do that. I was like, no, I hate this. No, I don't want to do this. No, this is the last thing that I want to do. But I just became okay with that. Like I came okay with that. I'm not enjoying the action that I needed to do to achieve the thing that I wanted to do. And I knew it was temporary sometimes, the really unenjoyable things. But I think people assume that there's this ease for every single person. I feel like that maybe is a fixed mindset. I'm not sure if that falls in that category, but like they assume it's easier for everyone else. They're the only person, the center of the universe. Things are only hard for them. Only their brain gives them resistance. Only they can't achieve this because it's too hard. When they're looking at people who are either at the stage of assumed ease because they're so much further ahead of them. So they're comparing your your, your month one to someone's year 10, or they're forgetting that all these other people are human who uh, like it's impossible to think that every person on earth wants to go to the gym every single time they go to the gym that's in that's impossible that's an arrogant assumption but people I feel like think that about people like me right whose livelihood is based on that or you know whatever else that it is that we're doing maybe it's someone who's painting or music or whatever you're all successful in like there's that assumed ease that I feel like people have and then it almost ends up they end up reverse punishing themselves more for not having that themselves. Yeah, well, it's a big it's a big should. What people do is they look at someone else's life or they start a new habit or whatever and they tell themselves this should be easy. This should be effortless. And part of that comes from the society we live in and comes from all of the marketing around, oh, if you just follow my six-step formula, blank will be effortless, right? So you think that if you found the right strategy or the right approach or the right formula, it should be easy. But the other part is like, just to call it out, it's entitlement. Like, who are you to think that changing yourself should be easy? Like, who are you to think that change should be effortless? It should absolutely not. It should absolutely not be easy and it should absolutely not be effortless. And there are really, really good reasons for that, right? And then, you know, touching on the, the thing you said about, you know, doing things you hate, we know that our sort of basic cognitive behavioral approaches to the brain will tell you that our thoughts create feelings and our feelings drive our actions. So let's say that your laundry basket is sitting on your bed. If you think the thought, ugh, I hate this so much and I don't want to do it, then the immediate feeling that you're going to have is like resistance or anger or rage or something like that. And the action that you're going to take from that is you're going to avoid it. But what you're doing is you're adding something to that initial thought where you're like, 
I don't need to love this task, but I do care that it is done. And when you say, when you shift from, I hate this to this isn't the most pleasant thing, but I care that it's done, that inspires this feeling of, you know, purpose or intention, or maybe it's like my future self is going to be so happy when this is done. I'm going to feel so good when this laundry basket is empty. And then all of a sudden you have hope or enthusiasm or something else. And that is actually what drives the positive behavior, right? So it's almost like by embracing, by acknowledging how you truly feel, you can start to mind manage yourself to say like, I hate this, but I don't want to, but, and that, but is where the behavior change comes in, but it all comes back to awareness of what's actually going on in your brain. And I think it's important for people to like emphasize too. And I know this happens to me still all day. It literally happened yesterday and today, and it's going to happen tomorrow. Is this like, we play up how much something's going to be awful in our head so much more than it's actually going to be. Like I did new videos yesterday for my website with my friends. And I told them for weeks, I was like, I hate this. I don't want to do this. I wish I could just duplicate and outsource myself. But there's certain things in your business and your life that like you can't, you have to do yourself. And they, we did it. And I was like, this was not that bad. And But I knew it wasn't going to be that bad. I knew it. But my brain was just root, root like it just was convinced that it was going to be the worst thing in the whole world. Right. And it's because I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to have to deal with it. It wasn't something that excited me in, to, to do. It wasn't work that I wanted to do, but it was work that needed done for the outcome that I desired. So like, I'm like, well, I'm still going to do it. Right. Like, I'm like, I'm going to just tell like, I'm just going to like, I know my brain's going to keep telling me that it hates it and it doesn't want to do it, but it either needs done or it causes more problems in my future, but this will solve more problems in my future. So I'm just going to do it. And so I feel like I, a lot of times I'm just like that voice in my head. I'm like, I don't have to believe what you're telling me, but I can just choose to act otherwise. Yes. Okay. So that is it, right? If you want to know everybody, there it is. The secret to Alyssa's success in life is that exact thing that you just said, which is called cognitive diffusion. Okay. So you have cognitive fusion, which is when you believe your thoughts are facts. So when the thought pops up in your head, I don't want to do this, like this is going to be awful, you treat that as a fact. And then you're going to have dread, you're going to have intense anxiety, you're going to take action, like, and and your, your behavior is going to be totally dictated by your thoughts, right? Yeah. But the second you diffuse yourself from that thought, and you realize that it's not that I don't want to do this. It's that my brain is telling me I don't want to do this. Or maybe my brain is telling me this is going to be awful instead of viewing that as an objective truth of the world. That tiny bit of distance lets you start to self-regulate and pivot and direct your behavior better in that circumstance. And so if the number one, like one of the number one things you can do is just practice listening to your own internal monologue so that and noticing when you're making judgments. So when you're saying this task is going to take a long time, that's a judgment. You don't know that. You don't know that. When you're saying this task, I'm going to hate it. This whole thing is going to be awful. You don't know that. You don't know that. That's a judgment. There, That's not admissible in court, right? Yeah. And so the more you can diffuse yourself from what's going on in your brain and view it as like I, you use this language too. I use it all the time. My brain is, my brain yeah. says, my brain wants to separate yourself. And that will be a huge advantage to your own behavior change. Yeah. And I feel like it's not like I always did that. Right. But you kind of learn over time. You're like, oh, when I talk to myself this way and I treat myself this way, I get the outcome that actually works in my favor and nothing's ever as bad as I truly think it is. Maybe the voice in my side of my head is an asshole and I should take what they say with a grain of salt and decide what actually is going to happen. Like, and like, it's so silly, but like, I, you know, you get, you get to that point eventually you're like, oh, I don't have to believe this. Like, I don't have to believe this lie that I'm being told, whatever it is. So yeah, I love that. And there's my secret, everybody. We figured it out. I got I got figured out on my podcast. But um, with that being said, though, for those that have legitimate desires to set new goals and intention for the new year or whenever it is, what do you think are like the true actual like steps that you would recommend them take? Maybe like, you know, towards the end of the year, beginning of the year. I'm not, I'm not sure when this episode will launch. I'm really hoping it launches really close to New Year's, um, if not that week. But like, what do you actually suggest other than like being okay with failure going into like in treat January like a failure month? Like how do they sit, sit down? Like what are like, uh, basically 
what are the actionable things that they can do with all the information we just gave them that gives them a, like a, I don't want to say a to-do list because that's giving people more things to do, but like an action list of like, okay, like this is what I could sit down with a pen and paper and do in order to ensure success in whatever that looks like for them going into the new year. Yeah. So I'm, I'll give you a to-do list people. So step one, you're going to sit down and you're going to review 2021 as if you are a case study. So I would encourage you to even like put it in third person when you're writing things down. So like Karin attended the gym. Karin made it to the gym 120 times this year. Karin did this launch. Karin grew X skills, right? Karin failed at blah, blah, blah. Like literally get as many of the facts about the year as possible. So if you can look at like your Apple watch and get your exact actual gym adherence, if you can look at um, your financial statements and like actually figure out how much money you spent on X, right? Get as much of the the pure data as possible and then neutrally examine that and see what you can learn about your own behavior, right? And one of the things that you're really going to look for in that process is limiting factors, right? So what's the number one thing that's holding you back or that held you back this year from being the person that you want to be, right? So for example, in um, June, I had this conversation with myself. I reviewed the first six months of the year and I noticed that my business and my behavior was kind of all over the place and it was all over the place because my moods were all over the place. And so really emotional stability was my number one limiting factor. So what did I do? I booked a psychiatrist appointment and I booked a therapist and I got situated in taking care of my mental health. And as soon as I I removed that limiting factor, it's like removing, it's like letting go of the arrow, right? You start to shoot forward mm-hmm. when you start to remove those things. So that's that's like number one, review the year, get curious, celebrate yourself, but also look at the things that might have been holding you back. Mm-hmm. Okay. Step two then is to ask yourself who you want to be at the end of 2021, right? So we talked about big purpose. We talked about this sort of like 2.0 self framework. So who do you want to be at the end of 2021? And when you go to, or at the end of 2022, and when you go to sleep on December 31st, 2022, like, what do you want to see in your year end review? What do you want to have accomplished? Like, what does that look like? Okay. And at this stage, I really encourage people to, you know, brain dump everything that pops into your head. So let let everything come out, even if that's overwhelming and perfectionistic. So put all of your goals on a big sheet of paper, okay? Then step three is to look at all the goals you have, all the things you want to do, and start categorizing them. Are they like an, a concrete outcome goal or are they like a behavior goal? Is it a day-to-day thing or is it like a big picture thing? You can also look at um, strategic byproducts, right? So maybe one of your goals is to um, walk more, like to walk five days a week. And then another one of your goals is to hit a new squat, one, one rep max. It's possible that walking more as like a form of active recovery could be a strategic byproduct of that goal of of being more physically active and squatting that one rep max. So look at the goals that are connected to each other in that way and look at the way that, look at the resources they pull from, right? So which of your goals are directly competing? And when you look at that and you start making connections and seeing cause and effect and seeing strategic byproducts, then it becomes much easier to either eliminate or delay and to say, this is a this is something I want. Like, I want to run another half marathon. Am I going to set that goal for 2022? Probably not. Will it be on the table for 2023 and 2024 and 2025? Sure, it will always be on the table. And I will table it until it's that periodized season in my life, right? Mm-hmm. So you can look at your goals and delete or delay. Or, and then you're going to end up with like one or two, ideally, (laughs) a few that you really want to like go all in on. And then the fourth step is to break the year into chunks, however that looks for you. That can be semesters, that can be months, that can be quarters, and figure out what your benchmarks are 
of getting to those bigger goals and what your daily life might need to look like in terms of habits you're creating and skills you're developing in order to get to the to become the version of yourself that accomplishes that thing. So That's I have a question one. that is kind of the antagonist to this. And Mm -hmm. it's probably very reflective of where I'm at in my season of life, but I feel like we might have a few listeners that may resonate with that more of being a high functioning, high productive person who maybe wants to do less or someone who feels like they can't reach their goals and they know it's because they're putting too much time and energy. So almost like a list of things like an anti new year's goal list, right? Like I want to do less of this. I need to remove this. I need to reduce that. And so how would you approach that for either, you know, the people like me who are like, my goal is to work less in my business in 2022, right? That doesn't mean I don't want to grow my business. That doesn't want to mean I don't want to stop making content. That means I want to be the one working less on the back end. That is my goal for my six months goal really is what I've set in 2022. Like by the time I finish my PhD, I want my business to run without me in the back end. That is my goal, right? I want to work less, which I don't think makes me the bad, lazy person. That makes me a smart, efficient person, essentialism again. And like, I know that that is a, if I, when I reflect back on my year this year, I was like, where were my pain points? Well, too, I was doing too much for, for, I was doing too much. It was too much for me to be doing. I could be doing other things. And like, I'm at my own personal limit. Like I like, I'm like, you don't need to do more. Like I don't need to do more for what I want to do. Right. Like I'm like, my goal is to do less, at least for the first six months of the year. Right. And I'm like, I'm not a failure because I'm doing that. And so like, I've already kind of done that audit on my year and knowing that that's where I need to be and what I need to do for that. But for people who are maybe in a similar position and, or feel like they can't, set goals because everything else is too much or they're doing too many of the the unimportant things, how should they approach? Like they kind of aren't, they don't suck at the things that they want to do, but they feel like they don't have that capacity to do them. Maybe is a better way to frame that. Yeah. Well, I would say like the whole framework still applies because the goals you set don't necessarily have to be new things you're adding to your life. Right. What I would encourage you to to do very gently is just to frame them as approach focused goals rather than avoidance focused goals. Right. So I bet there's a reason why you want to work less in your business, right? It's because you want more time to do something else, whether that's rest or have a life or, you know, do a postdoc or whatever. Right. So your, your approach goal is like, I want to, have X amount of hours in space every week to not do business things. Yeah. Right? And so I think the what people will tend to do is they're like, oh, I need to do less. And then they don't ever make a plan for like exactly how that looks. Yes. Right? And so I'm also trying to do less right now. Um, Doing the most over because here. Because I have a full-time most. job and a full-time business. Yeah. Um, and so one of my goals is to – get to the point where I can do everything that I need to do for my business in 10 hours per week, right? So that is going to involve like specific habits and practices. And it's also going to involve like big rocks or like big, big tasks that need to be done, right? So like one of the big tasks that needs to be done that I just am almost finished with is like setting up a project management system so that things are automated and they run much easier, right? So you can think of it that way too, in terms of like, maybe you have a goal and your goal is to do less with something. Maybe that's a one-time thing. Like maybe that looks like by February, you have X amount of money saved up so that you are ready to quit your job so that you can be doing less and be doing more somewhere else. So I think it totally applies. It's just about being specific about what doing less actually looks like and being specific about what the purpose of less is. I was going to say, and I bring that up too, because I feel like a lot of people go into New Year's where they want to do less of something they consider to be a negative behavior and they just restrict it. And like, I will not eat carbs in 2022. I will not look at my phone in 2022. I will not do this or that. I will not miss a workout where we know that's not realistic and that's not going to happen because you're going to do those things. And so I brought that up too, because I think that's how a lot of people, like they set their goals as I will not do this. Well, no, your goal is to use your phone less, scroll your phone less, spend times less on your phone and making that a goal and setting up that. And I I wanted to emphasize that. I kind of figured it was the same framework and that was the right answer, but I want to emphasize that for people who are maybe like, well, my goal is to not do things that I'm currently doing, right? And you're still, that still means you're still trying to do something else. 
Right. And you need to get really clear about that. So I have a lot of people who come to me for coaching and they like start off by telling me all the things they don't want to be doing. They're like, I'm always on my phone and I don't want to be on my phone and I'm an emotional eater and blah, blah, blah. And they tell me all the things that are wrong with their life, but they don't ever tell me what they're going to replace those behaviors with and what they actually want. And so there's an opposite of everything, right? So if you if your goal for 2022 is to spend less time on your phone, okay, the time that you're spending on your phone, what is that time going towards? Because if it's spending more time present with your family, that goal is a lot more pleasant to focus on. And like research shows that approach focused goals are easier to adhere to and focus on than avoidance goals. So that time is going to go to something, right? And so people too will be like, oh, I don't want to be on my phone at bedtime. Okay, what do you want to be doing and where do you want your phone to be? So flipping towards approach is is definitely a huge advantage. Yeah. And I love that because I just think that, you know, especially coming from fitness and nutrition and diet industry, it's just like you're just trained to restrict going into the New Year's and you're not trained to approach things or skills or any of that stuff. It's just, well, you're just going to grit your teeth and hope for the best. And then by January 16th, you literally are miserable and you don't know what you're doing and you have no and you just the, the bomb diffuses and it's filled with shame and guilt and who knows. And then they reel, they reel you back in for summertime bod season right like Mm -hmm. versus like okay how do you actually set the goals what do they actually want and I think my last question I want to end on because I think this is a big thing for a lot of people and I feel like just being the receiving end of a lot of stuff on social media in general has made me realize that a lot of people kind of lack I don't want to say this is an insult but they like lack self-awareness of like who they are and what they want and what's important to them and what they actually want to be doing not like like that same thing, the phone thing, like, yeah, I want to be on my phone less, but what do I want actually like kind of thing. And so how do you think for people who like maybe struggle with, you know, knowing who they are and what they want and having that? Cause I think that is a huge factor in success in a lot of areas in life, but also goal setting and achieving them is cause you have to be really aware of yourself. Right. So how, for people who really maybe haven't spent that time, maybe they didn't do the nitty gritty early 20 things where you move away from your house and you're alone and you're faced with yourself and you're like, fuck, this is who I am, right? Maybe they didn't go through that phase where, you know what I mean? Where like I cried in a lot of sonic drive throughs in the middle of Kentucky, right? Like they didn't do that, right? So um, what do you suggest for people who maybe they need to start there? right? Like maybe they're not even at the point of setting goals because they don't actually even know what they, they want out of the goals or the long term or the, the, the quarters or the weeks or the days. They literally just don't know. They feel like they have to have certain things, but they don't know what or why. So what do you recommend for those people where to start? Yeah. So I really hate the like find yourself narrative um, yeah. because it implies that there is a truth to who you are that is somehow out there. And if you like do enough you know, journaling mm-hmm. with like the right prompts, then you're somehow going to like magically like, there I am. In. Yeah. right. Like, Oh, here I, yeah, here I, am. here I am. This is who I am. That's not true. Like there's no such thing as finding yourself. You're only going to create yourself. Right. Yeah. And so two, two things here. One, I want to emphasize your personal agency in that, like take radical responsibility for your life. Understand that you can be whoever the frick you want to be. And you just have to make a decision about that. And, and like actually pursue that and to give yourself permission to be wrong. Right. So I have had like six different, wildly different career aspirations in my life. And every time I decided that's what I want to do, I went full force towards that version of myself. And then I was like, oh, wait, this doesn't feel right anymore. So I'm going to decide something else. So I think You know, it's like I compare it to um, going to a new restaurant. If you go to a new restaurant and you sit down and you look at the menu, you're going to think to yourself, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I like. Well, in that situation, when you don't know, do you just not order food? No, of course not. But that's people, that's what people do. They're, they're looking at their list of options for their future. And they're like, I don't know which one I'm going to like. And so they don't do a goddamn thing. And that's ridiculous, right? You have to order something. And if it gets to your table and you eat half of it, and then you're like, this is nasty, you can order something else. You're at a restaurant with unlimited money because in life you have time. 
right? You have time. Even if like you're old, you still have time. And if you just try on different things and make decisions about the person you want to be, that is going to be really, really powerful. So really just reminding people like everything, what if everything was available to you? What if all of the possibilities in the world were still there? What if you didn't limit yourself based on like your characteristics or in the past or like I've never been an X person so I can't, I've never been a tidy person. Guess what? I sure as hell am becoming a tidy person. I believe that is available to me. I believe that someday in the future, I'm going to be neat freak Nordine and it's going to be amazing, right? And no one's going to even, they're going to open up my freaking pantry and they're not going to have any idea that I basically like was a disaster (laughs) in terms of like cleanliness um, for the first 20, 30 years of my life, right? I believe that is available to me, even though there's no evidence in my past that says that I can become that version. There's never going to be evidence in your past of the things you want to accomplish in the future. Otherwise, you would have already accomplished them. That's that's how time as a spectrum works, right? So it's all available to you. You've got to make a decision, go full force. And then if that doesn't feel like an authentic version of you, then pivot. No, I love that. And I feel like so many people think that like you have to have it all figured out by some made up age range. And you've seen me ran on this, like you're not, you don't die after you turn 25. It's not like if you're not everything that you're meant to be and aspired to be, and you're supposed to be by 25, then like, oh, well, you know, you're just nothing for the rest of your life. And I, I like that approach too, because like, you're, it's, you're completely right. Like it's this cheesy stuff of finding who you are and you just are who you are. And then you do, you take agency and radical responsibility, which I like that phrase a lot more than maybe discipline too, like being a radically responsible person of your own being um, and saying like, this is what I want to be. Exactly. When I was crying in Sonic drive throughs eating ice cream for dinner on Sundays in Kentucky, because I was just so messy in my life and I didn't know what was going on with my life. I just, just like, okay, well, I'm going to go become this kind of person. And there is things that I didn't become or didn't do or didn't fit along the way that I dropped. But eventually I zigzag ping pong through the pattern of the mouse maze that is my life. And even Karin knows that I'm at another split and then I don't know where it's going to go. And I'm doing that same thing, but I had the option to choose those things. And I have the option to, I had to remind myself 16 times the past week that I can say no to any of those at any point in time. And then it feels a lot less stressful to make a decision of my future because I can always say no, I can always pivot, I can always change. I don't have to be the person that I choose to be a year from now, right? And that's what I'm even doing in my own life. And I think people, I love that, that radical responsibility and saying like, I can go become all these things and not looking for proof in your past that you are them. Because again, exactly, you're then like, what would be the point of setting goals and achieving them if you've already are all the things that you're going to be, right? Like then it would defeat the purpose of this whole podcast and we just wasted an hour and a half of your time, right? So I'm going to end on that note because I think that was a great take home point. Karn is brilliant. If you're not following her, I think 50% of her followers now come from me because I am just a, I'm like obsessed with her content. I think it's so good. I think it's so necessary. I think it's so raw and real. And I think it's a lot of like what a lot of you need to hear based off my self-perception of the fitness industry, um, which is a bias, but um, just from what I've seen unfolding for the last maybe five, six years and the narratives that have been told and these ideas and especially around goal setting and the new year and fitness and your, your life, right? You're all asking, you know, everyone else for the solution, how and why and what and where and when and rather yourself. So why don't in 2022, we take the time to audit what we did this year and figure out who we want to be and what that looks like and focusing back on you right? I feel like that's the takeaway is focusing back on you going into this. So thank you so much for tuning into the Messy Middle podcast. I hope you love this episode. I hope this was really helpful. I really wanted something that would genuinely help you guys take more action and your life's radical responsibility. That's why I'm going to fit that in the title somewhere. But um, if you're not following her, I will link everything in the show notes. If not, I'm probably sharing her on Instagram all the time. I'll link any of her offers or programs that she has below as well in the show notes within this app. Um, or within whatever app you listen to podcasts, um, whatever, wherever podcasts are available. Um, and so you can connect, look at her programs. If you're interested in behavior change, she has so many offers. I think she's expanding her team. I think she's in my 2020 version of business where everything grows really, really fast. And oh, it's a lot at once. So she's in that phase right now. So maybe like, I don't know, maybe like a small fraction of you go that way. And then a couple of you wait six months. <laughs> um, um, 
But anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning into the Messy Middle Podcast. Um, if you love this episode, please rate, review, subscribe, share it, tag us in your stories, all of the above. Spreading the good word helps me, it helps Karn, it helps you, it helps all of us, and it might help someone else who has this message. So thank you so much, and I will catch you all in the next episode.